Margaret, you were known really well to the Melbourne press as the fun-loving Margaret St George, and then to Australia as Margaret Peacock, possibly the future Prime Minister's wife. So who are you going to be next? Look, I really don't know. <laughs> my real name is in fact Ingram. That was my, my maiden name, my family name is Ingram. Perhaps I'll get back to that one day, but I think that, my, I think that the next image and the next life, I just want to be um, an eccentric aunt. <laughs> as opposed to your former life. Well, everything's former about me. I'm the former wife of the former everything and the former former. So if anyone just yells former in the street, I just put up my hand <laughs> and say that must be me. Is that a part of your life that you're going to uh, consciously shut out now? Um, no, I never. Con I, I would never shut any part of my life out. I love my life. I mean, I've had, I've had such a wonderful time. I've been. I've done three million things, literally. I mean, instead of, you know, my father always said, now go on this career path and you do this and you public service and you're there forever. 65, you can get out and you can retire after that. I would have done 65 things since he told me that. And I, I've loved that. I would never say to anyone, just stick in the one job. I'd say, go for it. Now, when you, when you were a little girl, you grew up with, with two sisters mm. and a very supportive family. How strong an influence have they been in, in your life? Well, when I was thinking about talking to you, I thought, now, what extraordinary things happened in my childhood? And, you know, in a lot of ways, I can't think of, of any, many, if any. And I think that that's because my childhood was, was so lovely. I mean, I mean, it wasn't without its, its ups and downs, but compared to kids' lives these days, that it was, it was uncomplicated, there were no drugs. Um, uh, I was brought up in Canberra, which was virtually a, a quiet country town then. It was a very normal, as I see it, loving, happy life. We have a photograph uh, here of, of you with your two sisters. Mm. Now, you were, you were very close, weren't you? And still are. Well, we, had a, we had a funny sort of a life. My older sister was, was really smart. I mean, it still is. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's the brains. And she matriculated, in fact, when she was 16, which was really young. She went to uh, Teachers College, so she was a teacher when she was 18, but it meant she left home at 16. Then she went off to New Guinea and the Snowy Mountains teaching and all sorts of weird and wonderful places. So after that time, we probably weren't as close, except we, we've always remained, I mean, we're always sisters. You know, there's nothing like sisters. You're blood brothers, blood relatives, blood sisters. My younger sister was at home when I was at home, so I think we were probably a bit closer in our childhood. But we're all good mates. I mean, there's something about sisters. Well, with you, your sisters having such a strong in influence on your life and being an all-female household, with the exception of your father, has it given you a, a feminist or a, a women's lib outlook? No, I think, I think um, I'm think i sort of past all the battles. You know, they were about 10 years ago. I hope all the young women of today actually know what we went through, and sometimes I fully suspect that they don't because it's just taken for granted these days. But I'm past all that. I mean, if I wore a bra, I wouldn't burn it these days. I would have then. Um, and I just don't like the names anymore. I'm, I'm, sick of, I'm sick of the titles being important as opposed to the attitude or the actions of people. That um, I regard myself very much as a person. I think I'm, I'm entitled throughout my entire life to have a choice in anything I do. And if anyone tells me I can't, then I'll get angry. But when people tell me I've got to be called chairperson and um, as I was thinking before, I mean, snow, snowmen out there. I was brought up with snowmen. I wonder what snowballs are called now, I think. <laughs> it, um, but snow people they are these days. You know, I mean, I think that's tragic. Who cares about the words? I mean, it's really, it's really the attitude of people to, to, to women and to men and to men, the same thing. You've got very strong ideas in, in, in that sort of area. I mean, you've got fairly, fairly independent thoughts. Who influenced you in that way of thinking? Was it your mother or your father? Um, I don't think either of them influenced me to be independent as such. I think what, what created my independence was actually leaving home and leaving Canberra. And that was a major, I thought, a major decision. What well, was a major decision? I was 20 years old and a probably a fairly young 20 at the time compared to some 20 year olds these days. And left Canberra and came to Melbourne because my family always came to Melbourne anyway for Christmas holidays. 
And I thought that was probably a major move and, and going out into the big wide world and getting a job and I remember being hungry and I remember being sick and I remember earning no money and I can remember having uh, $10 in my pocket and thinking I've got to spend it. But always having such a good time because I was in a, in a flat with uh, other girls, three other girls, and um, it was just... Uh, it was uh, fairly carefree, I think, but that was, you had to, you had to do it on your own, or you'd think, because mum and dad weren't there. What were you working as at the time? Uh, I was working as a secretary at the time, and a terrible secretary at the same time. I mean, I worked for the Department of Army, which often confuses people because I didn't actually wear a uniform. <laughs> I was a, a civilian, a civvy as they called it. But I was terrible there too. I mean, you know, it wasn't all that interesting a lot of the time. Why did you go into uh, secretarial work? Uh, that was because when I was doing my matric, my leaving, I'll keep going back to leaving because that's really what it was called, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. All I knew was I wasn't good at study and I didn't like school terribly much. I mean, even though I passed all subjects. But my dad said to me, well, didn't mention university exactly um, because that wasn't, you know, fe that wasn't a very female thing to do, I don't think, at that time, unless you were really bright. And he said, well, if you get a job, if you, if you do shorthand and typing, you can get a job anywhere in the world. You know, it's taken me until I was 44 to realise he was right. <laughs> I still do shorthand and I can beat all the men because in business meetings and whatever, I can do things in shorthand, they can't read what I'm saying. And I type a lot, so I guess my dad was right. Well, how did you make your transition from, from a, a, a typist on, on $10 a week to um, Margaret St George, PR person extraordinaire? Um, I sort of went through the... I think another quantum leap in my, in my professional, if I could use the term loose, loosely, in my professional life, was actually going to work for Malcolm Fraser because up until then, um, I was married at the time, hence the St George, this is where we get all the names mixed, and after that marriage broke down, that was the first time that I was conscious of wanting to, to do something in a career sense that was serious. I mean, before then I was 22 when I was married, so, uh, and I was only married for a short time, so I was still going through the, I better have a house and I better have children, and uh, <clears throat> my then husband was moving around, so it was, everything was temporary to a degree. And that was the first time I sort of sat back and thought, well, you've got to do something, and I was always interested in politics. So I applied for a job through the Nation Review, which I don't know if you remember, you're yes, a bit I young. Yes, I remember the Nation Review well. And mm. it was sort of a pretty, Red radical. rag, a sort of <laughs> radical paper, and who should it be but Malcolm Fraser? Now he was the last person that I would have thought would advertise in such a paper. But anyway, I went for three interviews and finally he said, "Yes, you can have the job." So that was really the time that I started working really hard, really hard, and uh, enjoying it. But I think that set me off on a on a different tangent again. Now I would imagine that Malcolm Fraser wasn't the um, easiest person to work with, or all, all respects mm. to uh, to Malcolm, but he uh, he would have kept up a pretty hectic schedule and been yeah, quite demanding. But for that reason, you know, it sort of sounds like when you when you talk about it, it sort of sounds like you're complaining. In fact, I'm not, because I think that 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 sort of job sets you in good stead in the future, and I'm sure it did. It was hard. I mean, I had friends then, and somehow they sort of we went into it with me, and, and two years later, somehow they came out the other end, and they were still friends and they put up with me cancelling things. I mean, it was just, it was a 24 hour day job. But for that reason, terrific, just terrific. And that's, I think that taught me that really you can, you can go where the wind blows, you know. I mean, when I got the job with Paul Dainty as uh, National Publicity Director, I'd never done it before. Well, that would have been quite a difficult transition for you going from a political role into uh, show business, that it wasn't your interest, was it? Oh, look, I, I don't know, Joe, because I really think they're very similar. <laughs> In fact, you know, the political work is, is public relations as well um, because you're, f you're the front person in, in an office for a politician as such and, and that's a lot of public relations. So I guess that part of the transition wasn't too difficult. And I mean, politicians are also... <laughs> I've got to be careful here, haven't I? <laughs> yes. um, they're sort of a bit in show business as well. <laughs> so you're saying that uh, <laughs> that you were part of the image building team for uh, not only for Malcolm but uh, but then Andrew. I don't know. No, I wouldn't go that far. I just think it's that 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 person contact is the you've got to please people all the time. I think in politics, which I think is sort of a bit sad in a way. I mean, I wonder if if uh, someone like Andrew every now and again wouldn't like to turn around and say, "Look, boy, you just 
show off. <laughs> what do you think then is, is the solution for the future? Is it, is it purely a matter of, of direction or have we lost um, a positiveness about the future? I think we've certainly lost that and the, the, I think that the saddest thing would be and it happens, but I, I don't know what the situation is at the moment, but I know all those, those questionnaires of school children, when they feel that their, their feeling of hopelessness, and if they, or helplessness, both, if they feel that of the future, then, then that's where I could turn around and be very angry at someone, because our children shouldn't feel like that. We didn't feel like that as kids. We felt fabulous. We all had jobs. We, we had money. I mean, it's not riding on the sheep's back. We all worked bloody hard as well. I'm not saying we shirked our duties. There was also a sense of community and I think that's going to, I think because everything's so difficult these days and because the economic situation's so, so tough, it's sort of dog eat dog. Mm. And we're not looking after each other and we're not welcoming our neighbours and we'll perhaps walk past someone who's hungry in the street and not give them a sandwich. And I think don't, don't do that, you know, we've all got to look after each other. Well, speaking of, of relationships with people, you've, you've been out of two marriages now and Is that all <laughs> yes two marriages now and now in your present in your present life you've met someone special special yes. again what what is it that makes a relationship special i get back to i think what i was just saying i think it gets back to to just caring about one another and looking out for those people you know making sure that it's like with children in a way it's making sure that nobody's hurting them or making sure you don't hurt them or uh, communicating about things before they get totally out of control. I don't know, perhaps it's just the person you meet at the time too, you know, perhaps it's just times, the time's right somewhere. Perhaps you meet the wrong people sometimes. Well, is, is the institution of marriage something that, that you would go into again? Do you think you're, you're suited to it or? <laughs> been a shocking failure so far, haven't I? <laughs> Actually, I don't. I take that back. I don't see myself as a failure at all. I mean, there are so many people whose marriages break down. It's just something. Yes, you're that, not Robinson Crusoe. No, it's, <laughs> no, and it's it's just something that happens. Um, I don't know about marriage. I, I like the idea of commitment, of some sort. I don't. I, don't, I haven't really thought that through deeply, but I, I would like to feel that same commitment again. I, I, I wouldn't rubbish it because e each time I got married, this is terrible. <laughs> That commitment, I mean, it might sound trite now, but I was quite sincere and quite genuine in that commitment. I mean, it was a long time between marriages, so it's not getting worse and worse here. <laughs> but it was about 13 years between, so I mean, it's not as though I, I, I didn't think about it a lot. But well, I, I, I like that, that form of, uh, there's something about, nice about saying that we sort of belong together, that's us. What do you think has happened to an entire generation um, that, that is divorcing at an alarming rate, uh, remarrying. I mean, it's very rarely one goes to a dinner party and, and doesn't meet somebody at the table who's on their second or possibly their third marriage. One wonders why. I wonder if that generation hasn't been seeing the former generation getting divorced and thinking that perhaps marriage or perhaps relationships, which would worry me more, are expendable. And I hope that that's not, again, I hope that's not what people do think. But I've known the children of broken marriages, for instance, to think, well, if this marriage doesn't work, then that's fine, we'll, we'll sort of get divorced. Um, and I sort of think that's a bit sad. I, I still rather, as I said, like that notion of commitment. But I wonder, you know, I wonder if we're not asking too much of people to say, I promise to love you for the rest of my life. I mean, the rest of my life is a long time, especially if you're in your 20s. You know, it's a long time. Um, I also wish that people would tell, tell their children really what marriage and children is like. Um, because I remember, and I'm not blaming my parents, so I think a lot of parents are at fault, saying, you know, going into marriage and saying, well, it's going to be roses and cherries and wonderful, and everything's fine, I've got the ring, got, you know, do this. I mean, everything's just absolutely... And the hill's hoist. Yeah, and the hill's hoist. Um, but there's that wonderful line in the Billy Joel song, uh, scenes from an Italian restaurant, they just didn't count on the tears. And, and that's what I think that people don't count on, that somewhere there's a rocky road as well. And if you can learn to get over those hurdles, life's pretty good on the other side too. Now that of your three sisters, are you the only one not to have had a family yourself? I'm, yes, I'm the childless one. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to put that very tactfully. <laughs> I sort of didn't get around to children. The other thing I've, interesting thing I've learned in life is that there's actually a choice in life. 
but nobody told me that when I was 22 or, or a teenager or anything, that, that women actually have a choice about whether they have children or not because really you were either, a, I mean it wasn't really that nice unless there was some tragedy that you didn't have children mm. in the old days. Um, you were just expected to have children, but I think, I mean, I don't mind not having children, is what I mean. Yes, there was terrific pressure, wasn't there, on, particularly on, mm. on newly married couples to, uh, you to were nobody. I would guarantee nobody ever said to you, you don't have to have children. No, no. no it, was, it was quite expected of mm. me, and so I did. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but you wouldn't regret it. I just like other, other people's children. You've never though. regretted it? No, 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 never. I don't think, to be honest, I'd be a good mother. Now, that's another thing that that uh, a lot why, of people wouldn't. Why wouldn't you be? Because I don't think I've got the patience. and I, perhaps, perhaps it's now that I'm 44 I haven't got the patience. I don't know. But I, it's 24 hours a day. You know, I, I look at my younger sister, for instance, with her two, two little boys, and I think, well, she works, when I had a job, she works <laughs> twice as hard, three times as hard as I do. I remember on air once saying, do you work or do you, uh, are you at home or a housewife or whatever. How outrageous to say that to someone because, I mean, the people, women, housewives and, and mums at home are just on the go all the time, all the time. And I just wonder sometimes when they ever get time for themselves. This desire to be eccentric, <laughs> you worry. make it sound as though the worst thing in the world would be to be normal. Um, I, just, I just like being a, a little offbeat. I like being, as long as you don't ever hurt anyone in the meantime, and as long as you're very, as you're kind to people, you, it gets back to, to laughing, I guess, laughing a lot. I mean, that's eccentricity at its, at its peak. But I love being a bit dippy. I love seeing dippy people, you know. I mean, we see people in the street, you know, we used to say, oh, they're mad when we were kids. They're mad or there's that strange person. Mm. And in fact, there's a certain sort of, um, well, it's a wonderful sort of trait, their character, I think. It set them apart. Yeah. I, I can remember reading accounts of, of, of you with Andrew on the campaign trail and all the press corps loved you because you sent him up and you had fun and you raced down the back of the plane and have, you know, a cigarette and a few drinks and a few jokes. Mm, I had mighty fun, really. Did it drive Andrew crazy? I think it was such a big task. When you look at his task, you know, that was a mighty huge job that he was, he was running for the leadership of this country and it was a pretty serious and totally thankless task. I have to say the media crucified uh, Andrew in that campaign and I think the last one he did as well to be honest but that's my own bias mm. um, and they underestimated in that 84 campaign in particular I think the, um, the, the, the opinion of people in the street but that wasn't my task you see. I mean my task was to help wherever I could and be uh, as loyal as I could, but I'm not the politician, I'm actually the wife, and I'm also still Margaret. So I was really just, I suppose, being being myself. I mean, we had some very funny times, and I and I count that still as one of the, the rarest of opportunities that anybody, uh, any spouse, if we can use one of those wonderful words again, mm. in this country could ever have. I would be one of a handful of people that actually had that experience. And it was tiring, and it was emotional, and it, it went through, I think, every gamut of the emotions. I mean, it was just every emotion you could possibly ever feel. You felt probably every day for five, me for five weeks, Andrew for seven. But again, you've got to laugh, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, Sounds you as though you'd have to, to survive. You can't take running the country that seriously. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think are the biggest issues facing Australia now? Um, I sound like I'm going into politics today. <laughs> well, you have had. I'm not actually. Experience. Now I've given up smoking. I'm going to go in cr crusading for smoking, and I'm going to get the quit campaign people, and I'm going to get everyone else, and say what you're saying is a whole pack of lies. They're all making up excuses about giving up smoking. The message is you've got to stop or you die. How's that? So you'd you'd be far more hard hitting in in campaigns such as this. Yes, yes, and the environment. I'd be hard on that too. I wonder uh, after the last federal election campaign whether people aren't being duped a bit about the, uh, I mean, paying lip service to the Greeny movement, and I'm as green as anybody, and then perhaps they're backing away this sustainable development. So yeah, perhaps I should be a politician. Platform, environment, smoking and AIDS. <laughs> That's right, you've get almost, a got a, you almost got a good portfolio <laughs> there. there. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you're approaching issues like this, it's, it's very, you have to tread a fine line between scaring people and doing something constructive? It's scary. 
what we're doing to but our you environments. Knew, you, you, were, you were a smoker for mm. many years, and what was it, three packets a day? So about 60 or 70 cigarettes a day. But you knew that that could kill you at the time? Yes, I didn't think seriously enough about it, though, I think. That's, that's part of that message, you see. I think it's just saying, it's killing you. You know, stop. Don't, I mean, they come up with things like, uh, you're going to be stressful, or do something with your hands, or there are strange times that you'll go through when you, you know, if you're a constant smoker, if you're a chain smoker, every minute of the day is a reminder of smoking, for a start. I mean, every minute. Forget mm. all that. Forget the eating. If you eat too much, you're going to put on weight. Forget all those other messages. Just concentrate on giving up. No, it's going to be tough. No, it's going to ruin you. I'm still ruined, and that's two or three months down the track. I mean, I physically still don't... I'm waiting to feel fabulous about not smoking. <laughs> But I'll get there, you know, but it's just you've got to do it or you die. How did you become involved in the um, drug program, the anti-drug program? Um, I actually had uh, a friend who was addicted to, a friend who actually was referred to me from the country, who someone said to me, could I help, could I get him some help? Lovely young 26-year-old who's still luckily alive and off the heroin, I hope. You never quite know because it's like smoking, you're always addicted. Um, and I realised how little I knew about the drug problem and uh, so I went trying to find some help and I finally came across some wonderful people at the Windana Society in Victoria here and um, uh, they started telling me all sorts of things and I just decided and now it's Hazel Hawke, Felicity Kennett uh, and myself who are all um, involved, Nancy Kane, the four of us are actually patrons of, uh, of Windana. I don't do enough but um, it's made me more aware of, of that as a problem too. Do you think that having been the, the former Mrs Peacock has left, <laughs> another former, <laughs> another former yeah, has left a, a, an expectation that you have to live up to, having no. been propelled into the... No, um, I've never felt, I've never really been conscious of an expectation. I've been conscious of an image that I sometimes got a bit annoyed about because m my image is the one that you've been talking about before. My image of myself is hopefully an honest person who, who cares about other people and who's dippy. <laughs> dippy, but, you yeah. said it. <laughs> <laughs> it's dippy. I don't mind being dippy, I like being dippy. But the image of, of uh, marrying high profile, I mean, you're supposed to be, it's the rich and the famous profile, which I didn't... I didn't you mean it wasn't hugely glamorous? No, it wasn't rich either. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's not my image of myself. So I'm happy to be back to my, to my image of myself and, and, and rest easy with myself, which I think is terribly important for anyone to be able to do. Well, Margaret, thank you so much for coming in to thank talk you, to us. Fascinating. I'd vote for you as a politician, I'm sure. <laughs> well, it's one. Bit of good, would. Yeah, I'm it's sure two. she would. A bit of good female logic. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Joe.